thank you for joining us. I'm Heather Saxton, and I'll be moderating the webinar. Today, Dr. Doug Marshall will be presenting Salmonella and Cronobacter in dairy powder. Dr. Marshall is the Chief Scientific Officer for Eurofins Microbiology. He has over 20 years experience in the food industry and currently holds adjunct professor positions with Colorado State University and Florida State College. Dr. Marshall's research and expertise have been featured in popular press venues such as USA Today, Chemtech, and Men's Health. He is a fellow of the Institute of Food Technologists, where he served as chair for two divisions and two regional sections, um, and currently serves on the board of directors. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available within the next two days for viewing. We will email that out to all those attending. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll address them at the end of the presentation portion. And any questions that are not answered will be followed up on individually. To submit a question, click the questions area in the GoToWebinar dashboard, type your question, and click send. Um, that's about it for housekeeping. So with that, we'll turn things over to Doug, and he will begin the webinar. Thank you very much, Heather, and I appreciate everyone taking an hour or so out of your busy schedules to spend a few minutes with me talking about this topic of salmonella and chronobacter in dairy powders. I want to introduce Eurofins to you very quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with our company. In the market sectors that we participate in, uh, food environment and pharmaceutical product testing, uh, we're usually the number one or number two uh, service provider in those sectors. The goal of Eurofins is very simple, to improve the uh, global health and safety by pro providing our customers with high quality laboratory and advisory services. And as a result of that, we're very pleased to be able to give back to our customer base with these uh, free webinars. So uh, today we're talking about Salmonella and Campbell, or excuse me, uh, Chronobacter, uh, specifically related to dairy powders. I do, however, want to uh, remind you that uh, Chronobacter is becoming an important issue in other kind of powder uh, products, as well as Salmonella always has been. So things like powdered proteins. Uh, outside of the dairy area, as well as uh, powdered nutraceuticals and dietary supplements, um, uh, health food ingredients, uh, drink ingredients, and so forth, all are becoming an important uh, vehicle for both uh, Salmonella and Cronobacter. And so today's talk is designed, number one, to quickly introduce the two organisms and discuss why they are uh, particularly problematic in this kind of uh, uh, food ingredient sector but also talk about ways in which you can design control programs to be able to at least attempt to deal with the prevalence of these organisms in a food processing environment. So uh, as many of you know, Salmonella has over 2,000 serotypes. And so when you look in the literature for Salmonella, what you're really looking for are um, um, the genus Salmonella. And then the other names that are associated with that, they're usually associated with the serotype. So things like Typhromerium, Enteritidis, Dublin, and so forth. So the serotype names typically have come from the geographic uh, location of where an outbreak was first described for that particular strain. And so it's the antigen that's present on the surface of those cells that determines uh, what the salmonella serotype is. Chronobacter is a bacterium that is similar to salmonella, and I'll go into the, some of those similarities in a few minutes. But if you look for Chronobacter in the literature, uh, you also need to search for Enterobacter, because that was the genus name um, prior to about 2007-2008 when um, these Enterobacters were reclassified into a new genus called Chronobacter. And the type strain, the one that we commonly associate with issues in foods, is uh, Chronobacter sacrosacti. Um, illness from this genus is almost always associated with consumption with powdered infant formula. Um, it can cause opportunistic infections of um, adults, but that usually is a nosocomial or a hospital-acquired kind of infection, so not really a foodborne agent as far as we know for normal, healthy adults. 
So what are some of the similarities then with Salmonella and Cronobacter? They're both members of a broad uh, family of bacteria called the Enterobacteriaceae. They're both gram-negative rods and facultatively anaerobic. Um, they're obviously both harmful to humans. So um, in terms of dairy powders, there have been six recent Salmonella and one Cronobacter outbreak uh, associated with consumption of this category of product. They are, however, pasteurization sensitive, so pasteurization is an effective way to eliminate these from um, one of the starting materials in the manufacturing of a dairy powder. What makes them problematic in this uh, food category is they are both very persistent environmental contaminants. They're able to survive many weeks. Some of the literature reports say months, some even say years, when the cells are in a desiccated state. So they're in a state of quiescent animation. They're not growing. They're not actively metabolizing. They're hanging out in the environment waiting for uh, moisture, food, and the right temperature for them to initiate growth and, and multiplication. We also know that both of these uh, genera may be able to survive a dry heat process when those cells are in a desiccated state. Let's talk about a few dissimilarities between the two uh, organisms. When we think about the habitat, in other words, if I were to send all of us out um, outside and start looking for Salmonella and Cronobacter, um, there is some habitat differences that are important. So Salmonella is found primarily in the intestinal tract of the animals. These can be uh, warm-blooded animals, such as mammals and birds. They can be cold-blooded animals, such as reptiles and insects. Cronobacter, I put on here, it's relatively unknown where the normal natural habitat of Cronobacter is. What we do know that it is widespread in the environment. And there have been a couple of reports that have associated Cronobacter with the presence of vegetative matter. So when you go outside, uh, you see lots of vegetative matter, therefore abundant opportunities for Cronobacter to establish residence and be a niche and also be a way to vector into a food processing environment. In terms of populations affected by illness for salmonella, salmonella can infect healthy uh, individuals as well as the infirm, the very young, and the very old. So resistance to salmonellosis is determined by the underlying health condition of each individual. So some may be naturally resistant to a particular strain, some may be naturally highly susceptible and of course, if you're very young, very old, or if you have uh, underlying immunocompromised uh, situation, your risk will go up. In terms of Cronobacter, what we're really talking about are infants, and particularly newborn infants, during their first exposure to um, infant formula. In terms of the number of uh, cases associated with outbreaks every year, uh, salmonellosis, there are millions of cases per year. Cronobacter is exceedingly rare. Only about four to six infants per year in the U.S. are diagnosed with Cronobacter. In terms of severity of end, uh, Salmonella uh, can be fatal, but given the population of cases, its um, fatality rate is usually quite low. With Cronobacter, again, because we're dealing with a very susceptible uh, host, uh, the uh, mortality can be very high, upwards of 50 to 60 percent infant mortality is known. Now then, for both organisms, for them to survive in the environment on the left and survive during gastrointestinal transit on the right, these organisms are exposed to a large number of insults. And so to be able to overcome these um, antimicrobial properties, these organisms have to be pretty tough. So in terms of the product of a carrier, uh, again, low water activity usually is a, um, a control factor. But in the case of these two organisms, it might also be an improved survival factor. Uh, we also apply things like uh, heating, chilling, uh, the presence of competing microbes. Uh, how we package and what the gas atmosphere is around that product, as well as the presence of natural or added antimicrobial. 
once your organism gets exposed to the gut, it's exposed to the low pH of the stomach, um, it's exposed to a growth temperature that just happens to be optimal for these two organisms. Again, there's competing organisms in the gut, enzymes, the presence or absence of oxygen, uh, as well as uh, other components in that intestinal tract. So these organisms are quite tough to be able to survive uh, both in the environment as well as gastrointestinal transit. Now then, what I want this uh, schematic to, to show you is, uh, again, this is just a representative uh, spray drying operation for the manufacturer of uh, dairy powders. If we make the assumption that the incoming material, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, milk uh, or milk components, have been pasteurized, then you're not introducing the organisms uh, through the uh, incoming raw material. Instead, how the organisms are getting into finished product is through environmental contamination. And so in the upper right-hand corner of the schematic, we've got air intake, and obviously if there's salmonella um, or chronobacter in that air column when it's coming into the manufacturing plant, then that obviously is your first um, uh, order of priority is to make sure that that air is, is somehow filtered to remove these organisms prior to being broadly broadcast into the manufacturing facility. And so air is very important in spray drying. It's also important in uh, roll drying because these rollers are typically exposed to the um, air in, t in that facility and you're also doing air conditioning to be able to keep that uh, relative humidity down in that manufacturing environment. So uh, again, anytime you have equipment that is exposed to that uh, air environment, you have an opportunity to introduce both salmonella and chronobacter um, onto direct food product contact surfaces. So what do we know about salmonella then during spray drying? Uh, the literature suggests that you get uh, two to five log reductions uh, depending on the strain of salmonella that's introduced when your outlet temperature is greater than 120 degrees Celsius. So again, that could be a kill step in a HACCP plant. What we also know is that the milk droplet size and the powder, powder particle size had no effect on salmonella destruction. We also know that once salmonella gets into the dried product, um, if you go through a redrying process, that typically is not a sufficient kill step uh, because, again, you've got dry salmonella in a dry environment, very difficult to control with a high temperature. This gives you an example of why that is. Here we're looking at heat resistance to salmonella in a non-fat dry milk product subjected to uh, dry heat processing conditions of 60 degrees, 77 degrees, 85, and 116 degrees Celsius. What these curves show is that at 60 degrees, the organism can survive quite nicely with about a two log reduction at most over a 10 hour exposure period. So very resistant to that temperature. If you go up to 76.6 degrees, again, you do get a bit of a log reduction but still, when you inoculate at that high population level, you've got abundant survivors after 10 hours. Uh, it's only when you get to temperatures above uh, 85 degrees you start to get some inactivation, um, uh, significant activation, and that uh, was reduced down to the below limit of uh, detection uh, at, at least by 10 hours. And then you get quick die-off when your temperature is above 150 and that's shown in that black line. So again, what happens when you are uh, dry heat processing a non-fat uh, milk powder at temperatures above 100 degrees C, you're also starting to get um, cook off odors, cook off colors, and um, um, a burnt uh, kind of powder. So again, although it may be effective to inactivate salmonella, you're actually ruining the product at that temperature. Okay, in terms of some of the outbreaks, I wanted to uh, point out um, at least one thing here, and that is um, although the outbreaks aren't very frequent and the populations affected aren't very large, obviously when you're talking about um, 
uh, the potential of killing an infant consumer, that's really bad PR and bad press and bad for your brand. But uh, in the salmonella uh, Ealing outbreak, what was remarkable about this was there were 33 laboratories that tested over 4,500 samples from over 650 product batches before they ever found the first positive. So there was an epidemiological link between um, the producer of this product and these uh, um, cases of salmonella Ealing. But it took a monumental laboratory investigative effort just to be able to find the first sample that was positive. Once that batch was finally identified, then subsequent analysis of products from that batch, they only found four of over 250 packages that had salmonella. And it was estimated the contamination rate was uh, around one and a half colony forming units for 450 grams of sample. So um, even though uh, it caused an outbreak, again, the infectious dose for an infant can be very, very small. So what was the industry response after these outbreaks? So over a little over a 12-year period, the salmonella prevalence rate um, in skin and powder declined from about a 2% prevalence rate down to um, a 0.01%. So again, industry stepped up. Um, altered their processes, altered their um, management practices, introduced more uh, sanitation uh, control uh, measures into their facilities, and they've done a good job in reducing the prevalence rate of salmonella. I do, however, want to caution you because um, that doesn't necessarily mean we can all go to bed tonight and sleep well. Uh, I want to give you an example of um, FDA current activity. So this was uh, a couple years ago where FDA did uh, what's known as a super swabbing event. So they show up with a, a large number of the, um, investigators and they go throughout a facility and they collect a large number of environmental swabs and they are looking for specific pathogens of concern in, in certain facilities with certain products. And in this case, it was a milk plant in Minnesota and they were looking for salmonella, and lo and behold, out of uh, 106 environmental samples taken, they found three positives for salmonella. And that was enough for them to write a warning letter that included the following violations. Number one, failure to properly clean and sanitize equipment. Because again, they found salmonella on this equipment. That was their conclusion. They also identified a high use of a high pressure foamer have the potential to aerosolize microbes. They also said a deficiency was that the frequency of cleaning and sanitizing uh, was inadequate. And they also discerned that employee hand washing was inadequate. So again, because they found these three environmental positives, this was their conclusion. And by the way, they also gave the uh, company 15 days to respond. So this is what you are potentially up against just in your routine day-to-day uh, -day operations. So what do you have in your toolkit then to control salmonella and Cronobacter? Well, first of all, we've got uh, good GMPs, um, standard sanitary operating procedures, your HACCP program, as well as a very, very rigorous environmental monitoring program. Additional control programs, including training programs for managers or workers, such as attending this webinar, thank you. Uh, there are auditing programs, um, keeping and monitoring your written records, validating whether your control measures actually work for salmonella and Cronobacter, looking at your written sanitation SOPs to make sure that if you have identified problem areas, that these are well managed in terms of control strategies. Uh, food label review and control program is useful because you may be sourcing ingredients that might also be bringing in these organisms. And then a vigorous testing program, in other words, to be able to prove that your programs are working and to make sure you're not inheriting your supplier problems. So this can include testing of incoming materials, in-process materials, finished products, and the processing environment. So what do we know about salmonella as an environmental contaminant? 
Well, because it's associated with animals, uh, fecal shedding is a primary way that the organism gets into the environment. So it certainly is widely prevalent in livestock production and processing areas, including the immediate vicinity around us. Therefore, it would not make a whole lot of sense to site locate a dairy spray drying operation across the street from a cattle farm or a cattle processing operation. Contaminated water also is a frequent vehicle for cross-contamination, so making sure you know your source water and whether or not it is um, uh, sanitary for use. It's commonly associated with feral animals. Therefore, your GMPs for pest control must be working very well. And of course, it's able to survive many weeks in a dry environment. Therefore, the importance of proper sanitation monitoring. Chronobacter as an environmental contaminant. Because of its widespread nature, you can expect a con constant influx of the microbe into the processing plant. Therefore, to be able to understand what that influx is, you need frequent environmental monitoring to be able to identify when that bio burden gets too high, however you define that. Like salmonella, Chronobacter is able to survive many weeks in a dry environment. Therefore, again, make sure you have vigorous sanitation monitoring. Environments with high relative humidity, in other words, greater than 50%, and the presence of moisture, whether it could be just moisture on equipment, it could also be standing water on floors. Those are problematic. Therefore, it's recommended that you dry equipment and that processing environment after a wet sanitation event. Also, for both organisms, you need to be aware that there could be niche growth areas um, within the facility. Therefore, your environmental monitoring program should be a search and destroy mission. Also, because introducing moisture can allow for either salmonella or coronavirus to grow, uh, it's recommended that frequent dry vacuum cleaning of dust particles within the facility uh, is important. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk talking about environmental monitoring because that is one of your best ways to control these pathogens uh, in this product and in the processing environment. So what are the goals then of an effective environmental monitoring program? First of all, I think it's important to find pathogens in the environment before they contaminate product. Again, I want to reemphasize this is a seek and destroy mission. It's also important for you to assess the effectiveness of your cleaning, sanitation, and your employee hygienic practices. So given a food processing facility, where do you begin to think about testing? Well, industry practices suggest using the zonal approach. This includes uh, testing both direct product contact surfaces as well as non-product contact surfaces. So as part of this program, the first thing that we recommend is that you develop a written environmental monitoring plan. This plan should include the following elements. First, identify your sampling sites. Make sure you have a blueprint of your facility that includes all the equipment and all the unit operations, as well as thinking about where both employee and equipment traffic patterns occur. Because again, that's the way that both salmon and chronobacter can be moved within a processing facility. So from that blueprint then, develop a facility grid. A grid size is up to you to determine, uh, but it should be a sufficient um, size such that you have a number of different grids within that facility that you can choose to sample from. It's also recommended that there be a random rotation amongst the grids. However, for sites that you know have a reasonable likelihood of containing either salmonella or chronobacter, I certainly recommend that you increase your sampling frequency of those sites because you already know that they are high risk. So also within this plan, you need to determine the frequency of sampling, how many samples you will take in a particular sampling event, what the SOP is for the sampling procedure, in other words, making sure the individuals collecting the samples aren't contaminating the samples during, during the process of collection, 
identify what test method you're using for both indicators as well as pathogens. Uh, also within that, make sure you identify when you are going to respond to an analytical result that is out of your specification. And then from that then, what are your corrective actions going to uh, be when you violate um, your spec limits? So where to test? I will say that monitoring for both Salmonella and Coronabacter should initially focus on your non-product contact surfaces in the post-lethality area. In other words, areas after the pasteurization step. I recommend non-product contact surfaces at this point simply because if you analyze a direct food product contact surface and you find Salmonella or Cronobacter, now you have a uh, recall of that if you find Salmonella or Cronobacter. So um, be very careful when you start testing for these pathogens on direct product contact surfaces because there is a product uh, implication with those test results. I also recommend that you initially start looking at these product contact surfaces uh, for indicator organisms to see what kinds of microbial populations you have, perhaps both pre-cleaning and sanitation, but more importantly, post-cleaning and sanitation, because that's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what your risk profile would be for pathogens such as Salmonella or Campylobacter. In other words, equipment that has uh, high pop numbers of indicator populations that may correlate with increased prevalence of Salmonella or Campylobacter. A rotation schedule also should be developed to ensure that all areas of the facility are periodically sampled. Periodically is a non-quantifiable term. I'll give you some uh, suggestions on that. But ultimately, it is your decision on how frequently to do this kind of sampling. Companies that are very sensitive with their brand and their market positions have a tendency to do lots of environmental monitoring, in other words, daily. Companies that are less concerned about their brand reputation will do uh, fewer samples. Last comment on where to test is uh, we recommend uh, being very careful with compositing or pooling of samples. And our recommendation is based on uh, if you find a positive sample and you've composited five to 10 uh, samples, now your cleanup, you just dramatically increase the size of the remediation you're going to have to do in those areas that um, have potentially been contaminated. So you could potentially save a few of your testing dollars up front, um, but more than lose that with uh, increased cleaning and sanitation when you have a violation. Now then, the purpose of your cleaning and sanitation as well as your environmental monitoring is to ensure that you do not have um, the buildup of biofilms in your processing environment. This is an example of a salmonella biofilm on a pristine 304 piece of stainless steel. Organisms were introduced to the stainless steel, immediately rinsed for 30 minutes in water, and uh, then put under the electron microscope. And what you can see is that this uh, population of cells were not able to be removed by that water rinse. That's why you need to use detergents to remove debris and organic material, followed by um, a um, sanitizer that is able to kill these cells. So why are you sampling and how will you use these results? In other words, please don't take your COAs from your laboratories and put them in a file cabinet and never think about um, uh, those data again. What we recommend is to bring that data to life and let that data tell you a story. It could be a good story that everything's working well in your facility. It could be a story that gives you concern about your practices and gives you an opportunity to go back and remediate. Then your subsequent test data is going to tell you whether or not that remediation has worked or not. So within this, please establish effective alert and action limits for indicators in presence or absence of pathogens. Um, conduct an investigation and an evaluation of trends 
as well as excursions from your alert NASH and limits. And so you need to take corrective actions should be implemented uh, in response to these excursions. So what I recommend, again, is if you first get started is front load your uh, environmental sampling dollars up front, collect as many samples as you can, and start looking at that data, plotting that data for trend analysis, and let that data tell you where you've got hot spots um, and where you don't. It will also allow you to establish baseline flora uh, populations uh, for indicator bacteria because, again, if you're doing a great job, most of your pathogen test results are going to come back non-detect every time. And how do you respond to a non-detect? But if you're also including indicator populations there, you get numbers back every single day that allows you to make management decisions uh, on the roll. Okay, we talked about using uh, the zonal approach in your environmental monitoring program, so I want to define what this is. Classically, zone one is considered the area in the plant where there is the opportunity for direct product contact um, on surfaces immediately after a microbial reduction step and before packaging. So again, this would be from the pasteurizer until the product is in the final package. And these are surfaces that have uh, direct product contact surface or have the potential to contact uh, a direct product contact surface such as dust falling from an overhead light, uh, water dripping from an overhead pipe, those overhead structures then also would be considered zone one. Okay, zone two would be non-product contact areas that are adjacent to or in very close proximity to product contact surfaces. So these could be things like table legs, um, um, coverings, and so forth. Zone three would be non-product contact areas within the processing area that are removed or far away from the product contact surfaces, but have the potential to result in cross-contamination of those surfaces or disrupt it in a way to transport these microbes onto a zone one surface. And zone four would be furthest away from the production area and would include uh, all non-product contact surfaces usually outside of the processing room. This could include employee welfare areas, offices, um, maybe a warehouse, and so forth. Okay, in terms of frequency, again, standard industry practice suggests that zone one areas should be monitored um, at a minimum of weekly. Uh, many would argue it should be done daily. And again, these are surfaces where product um, is exposed to the environment before uh, final package closure. Um, I'm not going to spend time going through all of these examples. Um, I'll spend a bit of time pointing out areas that are particularly problematic with salmonella, as well as pointing out areas that are uh, typically problematic with Chromobacter. But these are some examples on this slide. Um, again, make sure you're including lights, fixtures, piping, compressed air lines. And, and filters. Now then, if you are only doing indicators on zone one surfaces, you're opening yourself up to criticism from investigators, inspectors, auditors, and customers when these folks visit. Because a question they could legitimately ask is, if you're only doing indicators on zone one surfaces, how do you know whether or not you have salmonella or chronobacter on those surfaces? And so really the only way to do that is to occasionally include uh, tests for those organisms on those surfaces. And occasionally is a non-quantifiable term. I can't tell you what that frequency should be, but it's something you need to put in your um, EMP plan to determine that frequency. Be aware, however, that product that has been produced on those surfaces are at risk if your test result comes back positive for salmonella or positive for Crotobacter, because the assumption is that product also touched those surfaces, therefore it is reasonably likely that they are adulterated. Okay, zone two, uh, again, general recommendations are to do this weekly. 
these are some examples of uh, surfaces that can comprise zone two. And again, um, a lot of these areas are in very close proximity to uh, zone one. And uh, FDA uh, has taken the opinion that if you find salmonella or chronobacter on these kinds of surfaces, that again, it's a reasonable likelihood that they could also be found on zone one surfaces. So unless you have data to suggest otherwise, FDA may argue now you also have a recall event because of these observations. The reason why I say that is the recent Bluebell uh, ice cream outbreak with Listeria had this, this kind of uh, environmental data for that bacteria. Zone three also should be considered weekly. Again, these are further removed from um, direct product contact surfaces. But be aware that hoses that are being used to spray down equipment and move debris also have the ability to move organisms from a far distant zone three area directly onto food product contact surfaces. As well as any air that is being moved throughout the facility, all of that air has the potential to be a zone one uh, surface. Uh, in addition, some of these elements that are used to move product that is within other containers also has the potential to um, cross-contaminate um, clean product with uh, filth when these um, mechanical units are being used uh, throughout the facility. Zone four, uh, again, this should be done very infrequently, monthly. Uh, what you should use this data for is to go back and use it as an educational um, experience for your workers to be able to show them that uh, not only do we have to keep the processing environment clean and sanitary, but other areas within the company also have the potential to harbor pathogens, and we need to make sure that we're not bringing those back into the plant when we, when we go on break. So I'm going to finish up and talk to you about some high-risk areas within the environment for both salmonella and for chronobacter. This is based on a lot of data, um, both that, that I have as well as uh, you can see in the literature. But these include things like air aspirator lines. So again, anytime you're moving air throughout the system, um, you have potential for also moving salmonella. This includes your dust collection systems, filter socks on, um, on equipment, and your air conveyance system. So how are you going to collect an environmental sample from these uh, locations? They're usually inaccessible or very difficult to get to, and many times they're not maintained in a sanitary uh, condition. But pulling an environmental sample from the dust that collects in these sy systems can be very telling for both salmonella and chronobacter contamination within your facility. Okay, also looking at disassembled pumps inside the air ducts, um, any exposed insulation or exposed walls, eroded flooring, uh, junction between uh, walls and, uh, and flooring, great places to harbor microorganisms. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've had a salmonella events in food manufacturing facilities due to leaky roofs. Two things that happen. You've got um, a high pop potentially a high population of salmonella on those roofs and the droppings of birds that roost um, on or near the facility. When you get a rain event, you're washing that salmonella right into the facility. Uh, leaky drain pipes, conveyors, bucket elevators, very difficult to clean and sanitize. Um, looking at your employees, again, fans that are blowing air onto direct product contact surfaces also have a reasonable likelihood of blowing salmonella and chronobacter on those surfaces. Again, looking at the material that collects inside vacuums can be a very good environmental monitoring sample. Uh, love the maintenance crew, but they can also be typhoid marys within a processing facility because everywhere they go, they have the potential to move salmonella in front of actor. So anything they touch with their hands, with their tools, their lovely back pocket uh, rag can be contaminated with these organisms. And then some additional items. 
outside, again, because you're looking for uh, primarily uh, access that vermin have uh, to the facility, um, please pay special attention to those areas and make sure that your GMPs are working. Switch focus here and talk for a minute or two about uh, high-risk areas for chronobacter. Again, the external roof above a straight spray dryer, uh, good location for uh, vented uh, moisture, as well as if you have leaks, good way to introduce these organisms into that processing environment. Uh, sometimes you have um, moist niches within dryers where you have warm temperatures, you've got abundant amounts of food, um, and if you have moisture, then those could be areas where the uh, microbes can actually multiply and grow to high population levels. Things like blenders that are difficult to clean and sanitize, um, inside silos, again, challenging to clean and sanitize. But what we also know is your air treatment areas are really critical, especially looking at how that air is filtered and making sure that those filtration units are properly inserted, properly fitted, and properly maintained. Uh, anytime you have gaps around the seals and the edges of those filters, anytime that you've got uh, a pressure differential where you've got buildup of material that's uh, uh, where it's not working correctly, then air is going to go around those filters as well as the organism in that air. Floors with substantial foot traffic are known to be uh, issues with chronobacter. Anywhere you have high moisture aerosols generated from production and cleaning and sanitation operations can be an issue. And then also looking inside your dehumidifiers and analyzing the condensate from those cooling coils. Again, a, a potential spot for chronobacter to be hanging out and perhaps multiplying. So I want to make a special note again about these air filters. Um, these can collect microbes. So again, if you want to collect a good environmental sample that tells you something about your air column, try and collect that material on those air filters and run a salmonella and chronobacter test. These also collect food particles that are hygroscopic. In other words, these are materials that have the ability to pull moisture from the air column. If that moisture content gets high enough, it could actually be permissive for growth of these organisms. That's your worst case scenario is to have a vector point of high population of these uh, bacteria. So uh, one way that you can monitor this is, again, using your indicators. Aerobic plate counts, coliforms, and yeast and molds. Anytime you find areas in your facility that have high populations of these organisms, that is suggestive that you've got a moisture intrusion problem that could potentially allow these organisms to multiply and grow. And if you've got enough moisture for, for APCs and coliforms to grow, then um, logically you also have an environment that is conducive for salmonella and chronobacter growth. Another thing to be concerned about is um, rework. So when uh, a facility is collecting all this excess powder, is that powder then reintroduced into the process? And does that powder have a high population of these pathogens present? Again, if they're introduced post-pasteurization, um, Many facilities do not have a subsequent kill step to eliminate these pathogens. So sanitation is risky business. Um, obviously, if you're bringing in raw milk, those uh, materials um, have a reasonably likelihood of containing uh, both pathogens. Also, in your facility, if you have a lack of physical separation between your raw and your uh, finished product area, then that's going to be a significant challenge for you in controlling your environment. What we also know is that dry, infrequent sanitation is not effective. And when I talk about infrequent sanitation, what really is that? Is it um, once a day, once a week, sometimes it's longer? And again, from FDA's perspective, um, they're measuring a lot size that's based on um, your sanitation schedule. 
So anytime there's a hard break cleaning and sanitation operation to another hard break cleaning and sanitation operation, all the product produced between those two breaks is considered one production lot by FDA's perspective. So if you find a zone one surface that has salmonella or Cronobacter, FDA is likely going to argue that you need to recall all of that product produced between those sanitation events. Okay, what you need to worry about is uh, I hear many, many people in this industry say that uh, generally I have my situation under some control when I do dry cleaning and sanitation. When I introduce moisture into my environment, the population of Cronobacter and Salmonella explode. I don't have a good answer for that, but be aware that uh, anytime you're introducing moisture in a dry processing environment, you introduce one of the major factors that allows these microorganisms to grow. And that's why it's important to do a thorough drying of that uh, environment after you do a wet cleaning and sanitation. So, uh, Again, thinking about your process facility, these are some things you can uh, deploy to reduce your uh, probability of contamination. Avoiding cross-contamination. In your search and destroy mission, find your harbor sites, particularly if they're on uh, zone one surfaces, and design appropriate um, intervention strategies. Um, Increase your frequency of sanitation if needed to keep these organisms under control. Be very, very careful about using air and sweeping because both of these, when they're used to clean operations, they also can move dust particles that have these microbes attached all throughout the facility. And again, avoid using high pressure water during wet cleaning and sanitation to avoid aerosolizing airborne contaminants, just like using. Um, uh, there. So when it comes to testing, uh, what we want to make sure is we're not in a situation where we really have no clue what is on those zone one surfaces. And that's the whole reason why we do testing. I want you to be aware, however, that every analytical method for indicators and pathogens assume uniform prevalence of these organisms in the um, the site locations, or the finished product that you're testing. Be aware, though, that pathogens in a well-controlled environment may have a very, very low prevalence rate. So if this is the uh, grid that you can choose from sampling sites, let's say you're randomly supposed to pick 10 sampling sites, and where that dash is is the site that contains salmonella or chronobacter, your odds of success in finding that contaminant is pretty low if you're only pulling 10 samples. Similarly, you could have um, hot spots within the facility where you have large populations in limited locations. And in this case, again, if you're pulling 10 samples, what are the odds are you find these really super hot spots? And the answer is your odds are poor. So the only way to increase those odds is to pull a larger number of samples. And so uh, when you look at FDA BAM for salmonella, they do a risk uh, strategy for determining the number of samples to pull for regulatory scrutiny. So if you're dealing with a product that's a category three product, in other words, where uh, the final product will undergo a, cook, a cooking step prior to consumption, FDA recommends pulling 15, 25 gram samples or pulling a single 375 gram uh, sample. For a category two food, this would be no cook prior to consumption. Again, many of these dairy powders could conceivably be categorized as category two. They recommend pulling 30, 25 gram samples or pull a 750 gram uh, sample. For a category one product, such as uh, dairy powders destined for infant formula, where you do have a high risk consumer and you don't have a cook step prior to consumption, uh, the number of samples uh, goes way up. So in this case, they recommend pulling 60, 25 gram samples or pulling a 1.5 kilogram uh, sample. And those of you who work in the microbiology laboratory, uh, 
imagine what kind of setup you need to be able to enrich a 1.5 kilogram sample. We call those bathtub enrichments. So I thank you very much for your time. I have kept this um, under an hour. And so I will be happy to address questions that you may have. Uh, please respond to me by email, and I will respond with a, uh, an answer to you as soon as possible. My email address is douglasmarshall at eurofins.com. And again, on behalf of uh, the Eurofins team, we do thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear those. So that concludes the, uh, the formal uh, presentation. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Um, we do have just a couple questions that came in there um, that we have time to address. So the first question is, if a dairy powder is not going into infant formula, is there any need to test for Chronobacter? That would be a question best answered by your customers. Uh, we have occasionally been getting customer requests not only for dairy powders, but things like flours, um, soy protein isolates and the like, where customers who are incorporating these ingredients into um, products where they consider to be uh, high-risk products, they are beginning to ask their suppliers for chronobacter testing. So that would be the best um, um, indicator for you to consider that is knowing where your products are being used. And that certainly is part of the first things you're doing in your hazard analysis and your hazard plan is thinking about uh, what is the intended use of my um, product and are there high risk consumers. We've also had um, some for the um, emergency food rations where um, peanut butter containing products are going as emergency rations due to uh, wars and environmental disasters. Uh, these are tubes of a uh, higher energy product uh, being fed to infants. And in those circumstances, the international development agencies have been asking for chronobacter testing on, on that peanut and the peanut butters. So again, although the talk was limited to, um, to dairy powders, um, there is potential for chronobacter to be an emerging uh, issue um, for manufacturers. Thank you, Heather. Sure. Okay, this question kind of goes along with that one. You were mentioning um, high-risk uh, consumers. Um, are there other groups at risk for foodborne, foodborne chronobacter infections aside from infants? Uh, good question. The epidemiology is um, very unclear. Um, there is, in my research, I did not find any definitive examples of an outbreak or a case where it was foodborne for adults. So again, adults can get Chronobacter as a uh, nosocomial infection. So in other words, it could be respiratory could be a wound infection, could be a post-op infection. Um, it could be something that a very elderly patient uh, or someone who's severely immunocompromised might get. But the organism is not coming into, um, into their bodies that we know of through foods. All right. Um, those are all the questions that I have at this time. Um, if you have any additional questions, please, please feel free to contact us um, at Doug's email provided. Um, we will be uh, distributing the recording as well as the slides for this webinar after the webinar. We'll get it out within the next day or so. Um, so until then, if you have questions, again, please contact us. And otherwise, thank you very much for joining us.